Escape from Giant's Crown. Chapter 13, End of the Road. Throughout the decimated city streets, piping gave way, bursting unsteady streams of city fluids into the air. Lamp posts and power cables twisted, snapping at extended lengths, lighting buildings on fire. With the frame of the giant contorting with each step, the elevator shafts down the legs twisted clean off, and any airships remaining fled from the docks and droves. Gargantuan branches from the great tree snapped and fell, crumbling entire sections of the city. Homes slipped off of the giant's back like butter sliding off a hot pancake. The men of Giant's Crown scrambled to escape. Some clung to the debris hanging over the side of the lumbering creature. Others rushed to the shipyards in the dredge, desperately seeking passage out of the city. Most held on to whatever they could for dear life. Despite the chaos and destruction, dozens of men continued to climb over each other and up onto the arms of the giant holding the great tree, a last-ditch attempt to reach what remained of the peaches. But there were no more peaches. Empty stems hung in their place, but it did not matter. The truth of their splendor lay splattered over the towers of the rut in mountainous globs of fruity goo. The giant had been awakened, and the city of men built upon its back was no longer a city, but a death trap. Roofs and smokestacks crumbled as if they were made of mud, what hadn't washed away in the rain got smothered in smoke and fire. Mao took a nasty tumble when the skyhook wobbled and the rail gave way before reaching Byron's mansion, unlatching Mao from the skyhook. He rolled across the stone streets before impacting hard against the debris. Dizzy and shaking, he looked at the devastation all around him, his heightened moonkin senses going haywire. The streets of the rut were in an absolute panic, with densely packed crowds of half-dressed men running frantically in every direction. A foul-mouthed, fully-naked man with his hair on fire tripped right into Mao, screaming as he dove over the side of the rut and plummeted to his doom. Many others held on to whatever they could find, dangling from bent lamp posts or swinging from the scaffolding of upturned buildings. They clung on, desperate to keep from losing their footing as the city leaned and jiggled from side to side like a wet ham across a greasy plate. Overhead, several airships had already departed, and only a few cargo ships remained at the docks off the back of the dredge. Another tremor sent Mao tumbling across the unstable ground as he made his way toward the old attic and Bartol. He pushed through the panicking crowd from building to building as he stumbled down the swaying street. He hoped against hope that the building with the old attic would still be standing and Bartol would be there waiting for him. Got to, got to save Barty, he repeated to himself. I'm the only one who can do it. He struggled through the rubble, smoke, and twisted metal as buildings collapsed one after another. The slick surface of the stone road gave little traction but Mao pressed through. He dashed into a burned-out building and dove through the window on the other side only to angle his body mid-air into a slide to drift under a motor carriage. He didn't even know he could do that. Perhaps somehow ultra cool secret Moonkin powers had finally awakened within him. Amazed, he stopped to look at his own hands until a motor carriage spun out of control and slammed right into him. The impact hurled him into the post office, which collapsed on top of him. Massive wooden pillars toppled right on top of his leg, pinning him to the ground only a block away from the old attic. He tugged and pulled at the wooden plank, but it was no use. He was completely stuck. Nearly out of breath and lying pinned to the cold, wet stones, he collapsed in exhaustion. Mao felt the sting of defeat. He'd failed to save Olaf, and now he'd failed to save Bartol. Not only that, but the city was coming down around him. Well, it doesn't get much worse than this, he muttered. Suddenly, his ears twitched. A familiar howl echoed between the thunderous crackling of the burning wood in the distance, followed by Bartol bolting out of the smoke with Olaf's twill hat in his mouth. Mao's spirits ballooned with hope, and he kicked at the wooden plank. Bartol had always been a clever dog, but more than anything it seemed to Mao that they had an unspoken language. He gestured toward his pinned leg, and Bartol seemed to understand. He wrapped his large maw around the plank and gave it a good pull until Mao was finally free. You did it, boy! Remind me to get you a nice big bone when we get out of this. Bartol licked his face repeatedly, but Mao couldn't stop staring at Olaf's hat laying on the ground. No time for getting all teary-eyed. We gotta get to the docks! Though it was far too big for his head, he lowered the old twill hat over his own bushy hair. Then he climbed onto Bartol's back like he used to, back at the farm. Despite being slightly taller, he could still fit. He had to tuck up his legs like as if he were riding a horse, but he managed. Bartol stumbled and then found his balance. Not gonna let us get separated again. Mao said as he tied the old scarf from his arm around Bartol's chest, fastening them together. All right, Barty, let's see how fast you can go. To the airships! With a yip, Bartol sprinted off through the crumbling city. 
One last airship still held, just off the edge of the still-extended docking platform, as it loaded the last remaining survivors of Giant's Crown. Bartol howled and charged at breakneck speed across the gangway. They felt the dock and the warehouse begin to give way beneath them as the last of the city fell apart. Hold that ship! Mal belted out as loud as he could yell, but it was too late. They'd already begun to close the airship ramp. One of the passengers aboard the Talos heard him as he looked over the edge. Oi, we got two more coming! As they closed the doors. I thought we had the last of them, came another voice. They lowered the ramp, but there was no way that Bartol could make that jump. The ship had already undocked and fired up its massive propeller engines as Bartol and Mao sped toward the end of the narrow dock. Mao looked behind him as the scaffolding under them gave way and fell into the abyss. Go for it, Barty! Mao yelled as he ducked down to increase their speed. As the last plank of the dock fell, Bartol leapt off of it, sending them hurling in the air, but not close enough. They were falling. Then a sturdy, strong arm snagged Mao by his shirt and held him securely. Bartol swung from the tied scarf just below him, and they dangled from the cargo hold ramp in the underbelly of the airship. It's Olaf, Mao thought. I knew you'd make it, he said excitedly. As the strong man lifted him up to the ramp, Mao realized that it wasn't Olaf at all, but a complete stranger. Disappointed, Mao said, I mean, thank you for your kindness, sir. The last remaining survivors aboard the Talos huddled together and mourned the loss of their great city. Tears filling his eyes, Mao shoved through the crowd of the cargo hold, looking for Olaf. The crewmen revved up the ship's engines. The hull jerked. Mao and Bartol exchanged nervous glances. Airship crewmen flung ropes from the dock line, and the Talos swayed out from the bow at an aggressive angle. Engines reared as it sank. Behind them, the warehouse collapsed into splintered pieces. The crowded ship gasped as the last parts of the warehouse came within feet of ripping the sail apart. But the engines powered up hard and thrust the ship out, snapping the fasteners that were still attached to the giant as it stepped away into the ocean waters. The great airship drifted away as men fell from the great tree into the ocean and upon the limbs of the giant. No, we have to go back, Mal cried out as several people held him from the edge. I can't leave him. You can't leave him. A hey, kid. One of the men grabbed Mao to calm him down. Look at me, Mao sobbed. It's gone. It's all gone. Ain't nothing to go back to. When Mao stopped kicking and accepting what he was seeing, he knew that it was true. There wasn't a single solid structure remaining. The men near him cried. It's gone. All gone, one said. Though they mourned the loss of a city that he had no love for, Mao realized that their pain was just as real as his own. Mao and Bartol looked through the crowd at the burning, charred remains of the city. But there were no signs of life, just black smoke and white ash rolling off of the massive creature's back as it lumbered into the sea, its final respite from the world of men. I can't believe it. He didn't make it. Mao slumped beside Bartol on the deck of the Talos. It's just you and me now, Bartol. Just you and me. Thank you.